So, last week I wrapped up a, a series. We're going to move on to something else, and it's really what we're going to do. We're only going to spend a couple of weeks on, uh, but we're here right now, smack dab in the middle of fall, autumn, right? This is my whole, no question asked, this is my favorite time of year, and we're about to, in less than two weeks, we're about to celebrate, again, another one of my favorite holidays. You know, Jared was talking about Veterans Day, and I'm sure that's dear to many people's hearts, but I really have always loved, ever since I was a little kid, may have had to do with being a little fat kid, I don't know, but I have always loved Thanksgiving, which is why, you know, growing up, I actually called it more often Turkey Day than I called it Thanksgiving Day, right? Because, you know, all I was thinking about was, you know, uh, uh, cranberries and, and uh, stuffing and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I may have told you before, but growing up in the Italian household that I grew up in, we all we would make the, the uh, uh, trip back to Mecca, uh, or you might know it as Brooklyn, and we would go to Brooklyn to my aunt's house, and there'd be 35 people gathered around all these tables that were slammed together. And, you know, half the time when you're growing up, you sit at the kids' table, you know, and there'd be multiple turkeys there. There'd be like two 30-pound turkeys, right, to feed all these people. And both of them had two different kinds of, of um, stuffing in them. One had the bread stuffing, the traditional, what we called white guy stuffing, right? And the other had the Italian with the uh, pignoli nuts and, and, and the ground beef. And my grandmother would take it out and it would be like a little mini meatloaf that would come out of a turkey. It was wonderful. Just tasted, oh, I'm so hungry right now. Can we, I, I just, I'm making myself hungry. Anyway, I loved Thanksgiving growing up for the, for the thir- turkey, for the food, and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people still like it th- today for that too. But as I grew older, and as I started to really understand, when I, when I got out of those really young grades and started reading history and, and things like that, the Thanksgiving part started to become more and more meaningful to me. And truly, once I met Jesus as my Lord and Savior, the Thanksgiving part overcomes everything else. And I have noticed in this day and age how hard the devil is working at eradicating Thanksgiving. I mean, the start of the Christmas selling stuff has gotten out of control now. I was in a store the other day, and the holiday music was loud, and people were in all the aisles of the store that had all the Christmas stuff already out, pushing each other over, grabbing at the things, and just acting ugly to everybody. You know, oh, the spirit of Christmas. That is not the spirit of Christmas, and it's forgetting all about Thanksgiving. People go right from, the, from Halloween, which is a holiday I don't even like to acknowledge, All right, because it's got nothing to do with my life, your life, or anybody else's life in this building. Amen? Amen. And then it goes right from that, boom, to Christmas. And we forget about the opportunity that we have as a nation that some of the greatest men and women in our history made sure was emphasized. I'm talking about presidents like Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt. I don't think so highly of Franklin Roosevelt, but Theodore Roosevelt and other great men like that who said to the nation, we should stop and take pause and be grateful to our God for every bounty and blessing this nation has. And then, where we are in 2020, oh my gosh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in 2020. You might recall that we spent the uh, last month, November, uh, excuse me, last year, in November, celebrating the theme of gratefulness, right? Grateful, blessed, Blessed, thankful, right? We thankful, grateful, blessed. We we kind of adopted that for the month last year. This month we've adopted help us survive, help us survive, help us survive, it seemed like. Right? But I thought, John, if you Alec, could you do me a favor? I know you just sat down, but I waited for that moment to happen. If you could just stand up and put the lighting back to the worship lighting. And John, if you could get that to the full screen. What? Yeah, that's it. That's the baby. All right? If we can go to uh, slideshow from the beginning. All right. This is just a, a, a little throwback. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to put any music or anything to this. So next slide. Just some. Look at that group. Aren't they, look at those happy faces there. Look at them. Look at, look at how Alec literally passed out in this picture. Isn't that great? Next photo. Oh, look at the fudge you bell. Huh? Hey, look at how happy. Next photo. Look. Norman Jody. Norman Jody. 
God bless them both, right? Don't, isn't it? It make your heart feel a little warm just seeing them there holding a sign and nobody walked away in pain, right? It was great. It was a great moment. Next, next picture. Look, there's Rich. Rich sitting on a bale of hay. I don't know if there was ever a more appropriate setting for this man, but what, what a blessing, right? How fun that is. Next picture. Look, there's Dave and Linda losing their minds. They had just gotten married, right? They were only a few months married. Look at the bliss. Look at the craziness. Look at the happiness. They're drunk on love. Look at that. Look at that. Next picture. Look, I actually had two pictures to choose from. There was one where Arlene was covering her face with the sign. I chose to show her beautiful face. Amen? How nice that is. And they were able to get up again and still be here today. Isn't that good? Amen? Next picture. All right? Look at these kids. are all eight feet tall now. It's unbelievable. Look at the difference between this and what we're seeing here this morning, right? God bless the Perazzo family. All right, next picture. All right, once again, this time we got Alec with his eyes open, and, and Joey, uh, he's there. Okay, all right, next picture. Oh, yeah, these two, all right? Whatever. Next picture. And look, some fashionable ladies just, you know, being grateful and thankful that they're just so lovely and pleased with themselves. And then is that the last? Uh, and then finally, Joey smiling is grateful for all of you. Oh, isn't that nice? Thank you, John. We can show that. So you can put the lights back on. I just thought it would be good to remind ourselves that we like each other and that we like spending time together. We, even took, we actually, I, I didn't get, we didn't get pictures. I don't know why, but we didn't get pictures of absolutely everybody. Uh, that morning, uh, but the next time we get to do something like that, we'll be sure to make sure everybody's included. Yet, in many ways, um, even with that in mind, it seems like a hundred years ago, doesn't it? Doesn't that Thanksgiving seem like so long ago, so far away, so much has transpired, so much has changed? Yet, does being grateful ever go out of the norm for those who are, for, of us who have put our trust in Jesus? It should be a way of life for us, shouldn't it? You know, as I said, fall is my favorite time for a lot of reasons. I'm personally more creative in the fall. I love fall colors. I like it when there's a bit of a nip in the air. Okay, for me, that's all good. All that stuff just fires on every piston for me. I love that stuff. I've also told you many times how much, and as I just did this morning, I love that holiday. I also love the five F's of Thanksgiving, right? Family, food, fellowship, fun, and football. Maybe not in that order, but those are the five. Amen? All of that. The only downside for me during this season is my proclivity towards melancholy. I get very, it's funny, it's my favorite time of year. I'm so creative. I want to do more paintings and drawings and writing and all that kind of stuff. But I'm melancholy at this time of year. In our current state as Americans, as humans, as plagued-ridden mouth breathers, I dare to say melancholy, melancholia may be at an epidemic proportion. Along with this mood swing comes an overwhelming allure to things in the past. When you get melancholy, you start to look back. Many people, and even believers today, view the past with great satisfaction and pleasure, but look at the present with disdain and dissatisfaction. You know, I, I, I told some folks uh, when we went to prayer Thursday night, uh, this week I went to a, um, a, a sectional meeting out in Hamburg, and, and we were electing a new presbyter, uh, and um, somebody closed the meeting, and just shared. You know, it's, just not, it's nothing but like pastors and all sitting in the room. And they just shared about the dark feeling, about the depression, about the sadness that seems to be so prevalent in this day and age. Whether we, you know, the person said whether we have our churches open or not, or there's just this heaviness. And that's a real thing. And it's not just pastors feeling that. I think everybody is feeling this. And regardless of anybody's opinion about where we're at with the pandemic and where we're at with politics and all that stuff, there is something going on here. There's something bigger and more spiritual happening. And people tend to look back at these times, to look 
at, at days gone by. We, we look at, at days past as being better than today. Hearing in our heads the words of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians, where he said in, in the King James Version, he said, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We take just that snippet of that passage. We take it completely out of context and we are limited to full contextual meaning, which is all about how we should live, not about lamenting the times that we live in. That passage has nothing to do about the times as much as it is about to do with how we should live, no matter what the times are that we're living in. We're going to take a deeper dive into this subject this morning. It's couched in the idea of Thanksgiving, and we're going to open it up by looking at, at, the, at the book that just brings Thanksgiving to mind to everybody, right? You know what it is, the book of Job. That's right. I said it. We're going to look at Thanksgiving through the book of Job. Turn with me, if you would, to Job chapter 29. Job chapter 29. And I'm just going to read the first six verses. And this is Job speaking to all those people who were telling him how miserable he was. And Job says, I long for the years gone by when God took care of me, when he lit up the way before me, and I walked safely through the darkness. When I was in my prime, God's friendship was felt in my home. The Almighty was still with me. My children were around me. My steps were awash in cream, and the rocks gushed olive oil for me. Wow. Wow. Here's Job, in the thick of his trouble, going down memory lane. Many believers look back at times, they seem to really commune with the Lord. Many believers look at the days as the best they've ever known. They look at days in the past as the best they've ever known. They view them as sweet and as pleasant. They look at today as being heavy, constricting, a blanket of doom and gloom. They sit like Job in the middle of circumstance, and then they judge their present condition by a selective memory of the past. You know, I've got some really fond memories. I've shared them with you of my days in Bible college. I really do. The fellowship that I had with all my classmates and friends. The joy that I had because I got to study the Word of God so intensely, so many hours every day of my I mean, really, really. I still study the Word of God every day of my life today. But back in Bible college, somebody was testing me. You know, I've told you, the college that I went to was no slacker. Every quarter, we had to write an exegetical sermon which was not just writing a sermon. It was writing and proving everything you hit. Every paper was about 120 to 150 pages long. So literally, I had to do two to three of those a semester. I was literally writing three books a semester for all the years I was in Bible college. All right? So when I hear people in college today complain about having to write a paper, Don't even talk to me, fella. All right? If you're in high school and you've got to put together a paper that's got to be 12 pages long, when you've got to put down something that's 150 pages and you're working full-time and going to school full-time, then come talk to me. All right? I'm getting off the track. All right? I'm, I'm sorry. But I have all these fond memories of the time spent digging out the word and the time I spent with all my friends and the prayer time we had and the chapels that we went to and the presence of God. I used to love to get to that. Our campus was in Colorado Springs and it was up on a hill. You know what I mean? Away from the whole city. And once you drove on that property, you just felt it. It was so good to be there. Yet, what I don't often talk about is at that time, Anna and I, We're living in abject poverty. I forget about those negative things. 
Anna and I were so poor at that time because I could not find. The first year we were at Bible college, I've told you this, somehow the only way we survived was on Anna's part-time minimum wage job. I still can't make that math work out. God was with us so much. I couldn't find a job. I had never in my life, I started working a paper out when I was 10 and never had a disruption in work until I was married and in Bible college. And I went almost that whole full year, first year, not able to find a job. It was horrible. My wife and I ate more ramen and macaroni and cheese. I mean, you could watch me expand from all the carbohydrates. Because, you know, the devil's in the details. The devil doesn't make, you know, protein and good stuff and vegetables cheap. He makes all the stuff that makes you the size of a house cheap. Right? But we were so poor. We were so poor in Bible college. We, couldn't, we had nothing to rub together. My last year of Bible college, I took an associate pastor's position at a local church as part of my matriculation into getting ready for the role. And these people made us live in the basement of a board member's house that was dirty and filthy and disgusting. Every night, there was some sort of animal running through my living room between mice and rats and bugs. Glory to God, the glory days. Right? And the people that lived up there, upstairs were filthy, God rest their souls. They were the two dirtiest individuals I have ever known in my life. I like clean. I don't know about any of you, but I like clean. I'm not obsessed with it. I'm not one of these pre people shining something until you can see your face and everything. When you're trying to see your face in the wood floor, you've got some problems. That's all I'm saying. But I, I like it. And this place was disgusting and dirty and the smells. I think I've told you before, we actually had a guy murdered at our front door because we lived in the hood. We heard all the screaming and pounding and yelling, and by the time I got to the front door and opened it, there's a dead man at my door with a knife in him and blood all over our door. Yay, Bible college. I worked part-time in that same year. I worked part-time as an associate pastor and part-time in a funeral home, as a, as a minister of a funeral home in a city where the funeral homes shared the duty of being the coroner. So there were nights that I, my wife and I used to have to spend and sleep in the funeral home when they brought in dead bodies from accidents that were not all together. I have seen body parts fall on the floor, like, like in a mash unit during a war. I mean, this was all the stuff that was going on, and we were so poor. And in this mess, my daughter gets born. And here we are living in this hovel, but we were happier. And when I think back, I actually had to like, I actually, before I uh, started to put this sermon together, I had to go back to my journals from them because I pretty much forgot all that stuff I just said. And even more stuff that I haven't said because it's just too ugly to repeat the ugliness that went on in our lives then. Because all I remember of those days was sweetness. I look with a revisionist historian's view to the, to the past. I look at it as so positive. Many believers look back at times that they seem that they really communicated or communed with God. They look at those days as the best they've ever known. They view them as the sweet and the pleasant. They look at today, as I said before, as being a blanket of doom. We think, you know, to ourselves in these moments, we think, I was so close to Jesus then. Have I wandered away? Man, we used to do this at church and we used to do that at church. Boy, I wish we could do that again at church. Those were the good old days. Oh, if we could only go back. We've, we've done this over and over and over again. We look at days gone by and we go over and over again like this and lament them. Before we know it, as we walk down this little path that we call memory lane, our lamentations become complaints, right? They move from sweet memories to complaints about today. Because of so many changes and things we can't stop the changes from. All right? I mean, how many of you look at your fully grown children, but yet still remember when they were about that big? Right? Remember? Remember those days 
when they were really little and actually did what you said? Right? Remember those days when you'd come home and they'd be there and they'd be happy to see you? And all that good stuff? And remember thinking those thoughts of, man, I, you know, some people have said, oh, I wish I could keep them like this forever. Haven't, you, haven't we all done that? But we also know that that would be harmful to them. And we start looking back at that. They're still our perfect little children. I can't help it that they're seven feet tall now. But it's who they are. Well, mine's not. Some of yours are. But we've lost our evidence of being the church in this. We're no longer experiencing peace of mind. We don't enjoy the grace of God. We're heart of heart. We're no longer zealous for the Lord as we were in our youth. We've made this shift and change. I've heard Christians say, I wish I had the passion I had when I first met Jesus. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I hear it all the time. We are all suffering in this country right now from moods of melancholy. What's the definition of melancholy? Well, Mr. Webster tells us it's depression of spirits, dejection. It's a pensive mood. It's a suggestive or expressive of sadness or depression of mind or spirit. It's causing or tending to cause sadness or depression of mind or spirit. It's dismal. Wow, Pastor, thanks for the uplifting sermon this morning. But we're living in a country that's in the middle of melancholia. It's an epidemic. And this is what people are feeling and experiencing. We're not speaking here of clinical depression, mind you. It's important to note that before going any further, I'm not speaking today of what we know as clinical depression. Even though the American Psychiatric Association back in 1980 lumped in melancholy with all other forms of depression. There are still many, many, many psychiatrists and psychologists out there today that would still make a distinction between the two. We're also living at a time where everybody's popping a pill for something, right? And everybody wants to talk about how they're a victim in every way, shape, and form, and all this other kind of stuff. All that is added to what was simple melancholy has become now clinical depression. It's not all that. We are here speaking of a state of mind which could actually require medical treatment when we talk about uh, clinical depression. But there are many, like I said, who see melancholia as something that we just go through. For us, we also have to know that there are spiritual reasons for feeling melancholy, right? When you're not feeling close and connected to God, doesn't you? Doesn't you. I just threw grammar out the window. Don't you sometimes feel like God has left you? Remember what Job said in that passage I, I just read when he's looking melancholi melancholically towards his past and saying, man, I wish I could go back to the days when God took care of me. Did God really stop taking care of Job in this? We know that that's not true. And we, if we were smart enough, we'd recognize that no matter what we're going through in this life, no matter what is coming up against us, God has not stopped one minute of taking care of us. But we allow these thoughts to come into our heads. It all comes from, for most of us, something that's called the four humors. Now, among the definitions, if you were to look up the word melancholy in the dictionary, you would find some things under this. Ever notice in the dictionary, sometimes there's archaic definitions, right? That means definitions of the words as they initially were that have fallen out of usage. They don't really mean that anymore. You know, words change over time. But if you look at melancholy, you'll find one word listed which says, or one definition listed which says, an abnormal state attributed to an excess of black bile and characterized by irascibility or depression. I've actually entitled this message, The Black Bile. The Greek philosopher who brought out the four humors to us which are, just so you know, in case you're taking notes, you need to know this stuff, right? There was black bile, phlegm, yellow bile, and blood. How'd you like me to preach a sermon with those as my four points? All right? Gross. All right? In essence, these four humors, as those ancients understood it, are the metabolic agents of the four elements in the human body. And the right balance and purity of them is essential, in their minds, to maintaining health. 
Now, this was also added back in the uh, days of Shakespeare when Mr. Shakespeare jumped into the... You know, we get a lot of things from Shakespeare. Shakespeare, by the way, if you want to look at the one guy who took Bible passages and screwed them up a little bit, and we're stuck with people reacting that way, Shakespeare did a lot of that. All right? But he also adopted the four... Because Shakespeare was a reader. Now, listen, I know there's a whole group of people out there that think Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, and that there's a, another person who was really the Shakespearean writer, and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> I don't care about any of that. All right? I think good old Bill Shakespeare wrote these things, and, 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 and that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. But in that, he coined the following well-known humors, or personal. He took the ancient Greek humors and translated them into these four things. Melancholic, which is what we're talking about today, phlegmatic, choleric, and sanguine. Now, these terms are still in use today. We don't have time to get into it, but for our purposes this morning, black bile, melancholia is what we're getting at. I'll tell you this, those four terms of melancholy, um, choleric, phlegmatic, and sanguine, are, you can find books in every bookstore today. I worked uh, a little bit with, uh, God rest her soul, she's gone home to be with the Lord, but a Christian writer, Florence, uh, who, who actually um, wrote on the personality types. And this is the names that she used to call those personality types. The four types were those four things. And, and, you know, you can go and find tons and tons of material on that day. We don't have time to do that this morning. But I want you to know that people look at their mood swing, their personality type, to try to explain more. You know, we love life being placed in these perfect little boxes for ourselves. So we go and we do these tests. We take personality tests. We take spiritual gift tests. And we get the results. And we lock ourselves in. How many know that God will make you any one of those personality types at any moment in your life for any purpose he may use? Amen? A sanguine person. By definition, when I took that test years ago, it's still pretty much true. But, a sanguine, but my personality came out, you know, there's always like two, two sides of your personality so in these tests. And mine was, my, mine was sanguine choleric. The sanguine part, that's the guy that's the life of the party. That's the guy that wants to tell all the jokes. That's the guy that wears the lampshade at the party. You know what I mean? The choleric is the commander-in-chief. The choleric knows the right way to do everything. Right? So basically, if you take my personality type according to these tests, the sanguine choleric, that means I want everybody to have fun, but I want them to have it my way. That's not healthy totally. And how many know that sometimes God wants me to be more phlegmatic? Or melancholic, or something like that. There are times when all of a sudden my major personality types just kind of get put, pushed aside because he can't use them in that situation and needs me to act like another person. Does that mean I've got multiple personalities? No. It means that I'm open to being able to be used by God. But in this general malaise that we're all experiencing now at the same time, everybody's walking through the melancholy. We need to look at our master and melancholy. We need to look at melancholy through the light of our master, Jesus. How do we address this black bile mood today in light of all of the stuff that's going on around us? Well, certainly, we're not talking about needing more medication. Amen? I am not recommending that anybody go to the pharmacist after this service. God help us if my sermons lead you to go to the pharmacist, all right? We're needing to see how does this mood come upon us and what does the Bible say about it. Without a doubt, let's be clear, there can be psychological reasons and physiological reasons for, for bad mood, right? Poor eating habits can cause depression. Melancholy, however, is something that I find is typical for me personally in fall, and it has nothing to do with poor eating habits, although i got to confess, I probably have a few poor eating habits, right? Unless, you know, the only time I think melancholy is actually justified by eating habits is, is in reference to pumpkin spice at this time of year. I think all of that pumpkin spice does do horrible things to a person. But anyway, that's a whole other story and a whole other subject. But your moods can be upset by what you're putting in your body, the experiences you're having. For example, I was in a foul mood yesterday. I mean, a foul mood. The reason for that foul mood is I slept about an hour and a half the night before. How many of you know when you get up the next day and you got things to do, it's really hard to be chipper when what you want to do is just crawl back into bed, right? It's difficult. It's tough. It's not an easy thing to do. And you don't, you know, Anna at one point yesterday was like looking at me and I could see, you know, you get to a stage in married life where words become unnecessary. Communication all happens in expression. 
So I, I see my wife after having been in the mood that I was in. And she looks at me, and I know what that look said. The look said, what in the wide, wide world of sports is wrong with you? And so I said, look, I'm sorry. I didn't sleep a lot last night, and I'm in a rotten mood. You know, half the thing to do with these kind of mood battles is to admit you're in one. Right? Do you ever have somebody come to you and say, you're in a bad mood? Oh, no, no, I'm not. Well, I'll punch your lights out, you tell me that again. Uh, yeah, go ahead, punch my lights out. And while I, when I'm getting up, you can deal with your mood. We have to see what the Bible says about this. We're not talking about that need for it. We're not talking about these, these situational things. For example... None of us would say Job had a chemical imbalance due to his circumstances, would we? Job's answer didn't come in a pill bottle. Our answer shouldn't be so quick to come in a pill bottle. And I am not telling people who have to take, there is clinical depression. There are things that happen from chemical imbalances. I understand that. But I'm telling you, it's not as frequent as it is. And if it is more frequent, then that's a result of the end times that we're living in. And that's a result of sin spreading throughout us as a people. The causes of this state of mind, what causes a believer to feel that their walk is less than what it should be, what they get melancholy about, are few in reality. First, there's one that I've preached about for the last several weeks. I'm not going to go into detail of it because you've heard all about it. But neglect of prayer will make a believer melancholy. All right? A neglected prayer closet is always at the root of a spiritual decline. Do you hear that? You want to write that down if you're taking notes. A neglected prayer closet is always at the root of a spiritual decline. In fact, if you ever find yourself saying, why do I feel God is so far away from me? Check your prayer closet. It might be dusty in there. Just that simple. When we don't spend time with him, how do we expect to be full of him? Right? Because the idea, you know, we misunderstand this filling thing. I don't know where this comes from. Oh, Lord, fill me. Fill me full. Make me full of you, Jesus. Oh, I got filled. I'm now filled. I don't ever need to be filled again. What? What are you filled with? Antifreeze? What are you filled with? If you're filled with the Spirit of God, you're supposed to be pouring that out. You should daily need an infilling of, of God. You should be exhausted. You should be empty of it. You should be going to God at the end of the day. Oops, spent it all. Can I have some more? more? It's that simple. So if the closet is empty, so are we. The second thing that believers run into that causes this, this melancholy is idolatry. Too many of us think of idolatry as like, you know, the image of the beast and Daniel's you know, the, the giant statues that Nebuchadnezzar made and, and the Moloch and the worship of this and Baal and all those kind of things. But have, the question we have to ask ourselves is, have our affections been on the things of this earth rather than the things of heaven? Now, do you understand? And I'm gonna, I might get in trouble with this. Let me think about this a minute before I let this out of the old Boco Grande. But do you understand that your family is not the things of heaven? You get that, don't you? In, a, in our living, in our world, God has blessed us with every one of our family members. No doubt. Each and every one of them is a gift from God. But they ain't heaven. And they don't actually absolutely exist in everything that it's an absolute needing of your attention more than God's. If any member of your family gets more attention than God gets, that member of your family is an idolatry. If your job gets more of your attention. If your hobbies get more of your attention. If you derive more joy from putting together model train sets in your basement than you get from spending time in your prayer closet, guess what? You're an idolater. Joy comes from God. Joy cannot. True joy. Now, fleeting happiness comes from a lot of these things. Right? You can see it on our family faces. When your kid comes to you and asks you to do something with them and you, without giving them a reason for why you can't do it, just go ahead and do it with them, they usually are pretty happy about it, aren't they? But that's not joy. And it's not what gets us into melancholy. And the third thing that believers run into 
that may be the root for why they feel melancholia is pride. Sometimes our self-confidence becomes self-righteousness and we drift without knowing. When we get to that point where we think we got it all together and we can do this thing, we're in a bad place. We're in a bad place. When you think you've got your act together, oh boy. Oh boy. We always need to take inventory and to pay attention to what's happening in our lives so that we can move forward, so that we can be closer to God. God will not allow in his presence somebody full of themselves. You understand that, right? And just because you said some prayer years ago, oh, Jesus, come into my heart, doesn't mean you can't like, push out some of the Holy Spirit and get full of yourself. We've all done it, right? So let's be honest with each other and say, let's get ourselves out and Jesus in. More of Jesus, less of us, will not suffer really negative melancholy. Now, is all this stuff that I just mentioned, all those things bad necessarily? Well, obviously, I don't see anything about my autumnal uh, melancholy thoughts that I have every year as negative in my life. They actually serve me pretty well. I get a lot of cool things done in the fall. Job was devastated and deeply searching for the why of his present calamities. I've told you before, sometimes the question why gets us in more trouble than any answer we could ever get. There are times when we must look at the past, but not in order for us to miss them, but rather to remind ourselves of the ever-present love of God for us. You know, when I went back and looked at old journals and, and dug up some stuff of myself back in the early 80s and whatever, the one consistency I read in those journals was how faithful God was to me, how faithful he was at every turn. And whenever I look to the past, whenever God makes me look, when God says to me, Jim, do you remember that time we did this? It wasn't so that I can go, oh, yeah, that felt good. It's to remind me that the reason it felt good was that he was with me in that time. And to acknowledge right now in the here and now, you might want to stop and think, Jim, I'm still with you. The good times are now. What I'm here to tell you this morning is that all those days that you look back as good, and they were great back then, they were. But they can't compare to what he can do for you today and what he wants to do for you tomorrow. We are to be reminded that he promised to never leave us or forsake us and to be with us always. Amen? So any thought we have that God's not with us is a flawed, wrong, incorrect thought. Because he always wants to be with us. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. It's a very familiar piece of scripture. Romans chapter 8, towards the end of the chapter, starting at verse 38. Paul, writing to those Romans, Paul writing to all those obnoxious Italians. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can be affected by so many outside sources. Everything from rainy weather to the great tragedies that one might suffer in life like Job did. I want you to notice that passage in Romans chapter 8, because a lot of people misuse that passage to put forth a theology that I don't personally agree with. I'm not going to get, I don't argue Christian theology. There are camps in the Church of Christ today that believe this, and there are other camps. I am not in that camp of believing this. But the verse does say nothing can separate you from God's love. It does not say nothing can separate you from God. Because the one thing that can separate you from God is you. You can walk away from God. It's just that simple. I've known too many people that have done it. Absolutely too many people have done it. it is, I, I know it both by the Bible, theologically, and by experience. I've seen people do it. I've shared with you the number of guys that I went to Bible college with who no longer even know Jesus today, much less are still in the pastorate. It happens all the time. 
So that's not where that verse is going. But what it is saying to us is that what we experience through God's love, one of the things we experience is that joy and that sense of peace and that thing that comes over us that feels good and righteous. Amen? And nothing can tear that away. Nothing that happens to you can tear you away from God. Nothing that happens to you can tear you away from God's love. There are so many people out there who the minute something goes wrong in their lives, they blame God and give up on them. You know, people who, who lose their homes because they couldn't pay their mortgage. Instead of looking back at experiences of all the things that they may have done and bad decisions they may have made that led to them not being able to get their mortgage, or instead of looking at the fact that maybe some outside force like the enemy disrupted your world, just like he did to Job, we seem to want to think that Job is the only guy that this happens to. When I look at the things that Anna and I went through in Bible college that I told you about and the things that I didn't list to you, I know that the devil had his sights on me. I know this morning when I had that unbelievable feeling of God's presence in my life and all of a sudden it seemed like it was ripped out from me, guess what? Guess who is afoot? It's a pretty simple thing. You don't have to be a brain surgeon or a theologian to figure this one out. We can be affected by so many things. Remember one thing about the book of Job. Maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, but Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. Did you know that? Job was written centuries before the first five books of the Bible. It's the oldest book in the Bible. I find it really, you know, God doesn't do anything just because he's, he's bored. You know what I mean? There's two words I fear out of my wife. Really, there are. Just two words. You may not know what they are, but I'm going to tell you. She's in the nursery now. I'm hoping she's not listening because it lets out my secret. Oh, gosh, she's looking. I may be in trouble. Anyway, <laughs> when my wife turns to me and says, I'm bored, I know that my world from that moment has just changed because it's not I'm bored with what I'm doing. It's I'm bored. Therefore, everything will be readjusted and changed. This program you're watching and enjoying, no more! That thing you wanted to do, no more! Now an adjustment must happen. And in all fairness, when I turn to my wife and I say, which, quite frankly, I don't think happens as often, but I say, I'm bored, she knows the same thing too. Whatever she's doing right there and then better change, because I'm bored. She must amuse me. Do a dance. God never has been, ever will be, bored. It is impossible for the creator of all to be bored. So when we find something in Scripture or something about Scripture, it wasn't put there because God was bored and wanted to put to, you know, we sometimes look at things we discover in Scripture and go, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. I never saw that before. God must have been bored and put that in there for just for me to have a special thing. Let me tell you, the fact that Job is the first and oldest book of the Bible I think is important. Because God saw fit to let us know before everything else, your life would suck. Pardon my language. <gasps> Pastor, don't use words. I'm using that word because that's what happens sometimes. You've all used that word. You just don't use it in front of me. The truth of the matter is that sometimes life is awful. And we don't like it. And we, we get ticked off by just being in it. I'm not happy with this situation. I'm not glad that my family is doing this. I'm not happy that they're doing this at work. I'm not happy that the world has gone this way. I can't stand COVID! My daughter went to her missionary, um, uh, what do they call it, conference, where they bring all the missionaries that, from her organization from all over the world. They have a conference every year and all that kind of stuff. They made a rule you couldn't use the word COVID. <laughs> what? Are we really going to adjust our good mood by not saying the word? Yeah, sure. I got to walk everywhere on the planet with this flipping thing all over my face. But I can't say COVID. That's how goofy we are. Truly, truly goofy. Amen? Job was put there so we could realize that all the good stuff God was about to bring 
was get, would, would happen even through the ugliness of the life we may have to at times live. And I'm not saying that I think my life is ugly all the time. I got plenty of good moments, just like so, so many of you do. But before the histories and before the poetry and before the letters of instruction from the apostles, God recorded for us the means of getting through life no matter what. No matter what. Can I ask the guys to come up? So believer, don't settle for wishing for a return of better days, for former happinesses. Go immediately, seek the Lord while he may be found, and tell him of your sadness, and bring your melancholy to God. I'd suggest you prep yourself to give your melancholy as a gift to God. He will receive it as a gift. Ask him for grace and strength and the ability to give thanks at all times, Ask him to help you walk more closely with him. Humble yourselves before him, and he will lift you up and ensure for you the ability to enjoy the light of his presence in your life. Don't sit down to sigh and lament while you have Holy Spirit, Jesus the Son, God the Father, to uphold you throughout your days. As we have said throughout the past weeks, There is no person, no situation, no disaster, nothing out of reach of God's good grace. And as we just read in Romans 8, there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. And for that, most of us should and will be thankful. Amen? Thankful. I was driving to church this morning. After all that hubbubaloo, went on in my life and everything was going wrong. And I turned to Anna. Well, I didn't turn to Anna because I was driving. I said to Anna, I said, man, I was having such a good morning. And my wife turned to me and said, you still are. I hate it when she's right. I still am. I'm still having a good morning. Anna, come here a minute. Like I said to Alex, come faster. You see, at least, Alec, God bless you. You don't do that to me. All right. Now, everybody stand with me. Stand with us. So I'm going to give you, you, you can tell all your friends, hey, man, you ought to come to our church because you get bonuses at New Waters Church. Here's a little bonus. Here's a little tidbit. Here's a little practice. All right? Now, you can only do this with family members because of COVID. So if you don't have a family member here, Just go anywhere where you can't be seen on camera. And I'm going to give you the one thing everybody can do that'll get you through everything in life. You ready? Go ahead. Try it out. Go hug somebody near you. Don't just stand there and look at me. You're creeping me out now. We'll hug each other. I'm not lying. Hug. We ain't going until you hug. Hug the person next to you. Make it count. There you go. Do what he's doing if you're by yourself. That is the essence of what cures all of our ills. I often read the book of Job and say, why didn't somebody give Job a hug? 40-something chapters. Not one hug. Not one friend who said, Joby, baby. They came and they sat near him, used his fire, took up his heat, and told him what a jerk he was. And then his wife said, curse God and die. Maybe if she had said that and hugged him, we'd have a different opinion of Job's wife today. This woman said to me, I'm still having a good day. She was right. We always will have a good day. Amen? So I want us to have a good day today. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. It doesn't matter whether your paycheck's big enough. It doesn't matter whether or not you're tall enough to play for the NBA. I don't know who might be thinking that. I'm just throwing things out. But we can enjoy God in every moment of the day. Now, 
With that in mind, I've asked these guys to repeat one of the songs that we sang this morning.